Mark, uh, how are you? Uh, I'm very well, thank you. We've been, um, if I look in my diary, I think uh, I'm now, this week we entered uh, week 11 of lockdown here in Shropshire. Extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. Been the Shropshire, the Shropshire. time in my life at home. I know, I feel the same. <laughs> my family's getting very, very sick of me. So, um, <laughs> but Shropshire is a nice place to be, to be stuck during all this. Uh, we're very lucky and I'll tell you what, today the weather is I mean, beyond gorgeous. It's, it's Mediterranean temperatures here. I should not be indoors with my tie on talking to you. I should be outdoors sunbathing on the, uh, on the lawn. But I'm not allowed to. That's working time. Well, I'll try not to keep you. So, you, you know, hopefully you can, you can get a few hours in the sun a bit later. But you, uh, it's the same here. I mean, it's been a spectacular spring. We've been very lucky. Yeah, the next thing we're going to worry about is lack of rainfall, isn't it? There has been no rain virtually in May. So that's, that's going to good. be, we're going to get back to good old hosepipe bands again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Weird. Yeah, my grass is going to look very sorry for itself in a few weeks, I'm sure. <laughs> I'll um, just make sure the phone turned off. Yeah, I do. Yeah. So, uh, the, so great to have an opportunity to talk. Um, let's start with uh, the obvious, I suppose, uh, coronavirus and where and how Heeson's been kind of operating through it all and um, whether how production has been affected and all that kind of stuff. So over to you. Yes. Wow. Well, no one saw that one coming, did they? Uh, I remember back in February, I was on holiday and this whole thing sort of started to appear on the press and we all thought, oh, well, you know, what's everybody going on about? It's only going to be a, maybe a bad dose of flu, but, you know, be in bed for a couple of days and, and that's it. Little did I expect 11 weeks later, the entire world will have shut down, that uh, the, the skies will be clear of um, aeroplanes, that smog will disappear, that the oceans will start to clean up again. It's, uh, I don't think ever again in our lives or probably even our children's lives will we see the whole world simultaneously shut down. It is, it is something quite extraordinary to have been part of. Anyway, that's not the point. How's Heeson coat? Well, uh, um, I'd like to say on two, two accounts, either we've been very lucky or probably more to the truth is that the Dutch are actually very organized people because the shipyard um, has not closed, for which I think we are very lucky. Um, very early on in the outbreak, uh, we realized that this was bad and uh, we moved to a two shift system. So instead of working normal, um, what is it, seven till four, we moved to a starting at five o'clock in the morning and finishing at 10 o'clock at night. This meant that we could literally halve the number of people on the yachts uh, in order to start the social distancing. And we started that program really extremely early on. I mean, in very early March, uh, we did the same in our canteen where everybody uh, meets for lunch. So that was all split up. We did the same for our entry and exit procedures so that people weren't bunched up close together when they arrive and depart. And of course, all the office people such as myself were, um, were sent home where possible to work at home. Um, and of course, I've been here ever since. Um, and, but most of the office people in the shipyard are, are working part time at home and part time in the shipyard. Uh, so it's, it hasn't been too bad. And I'm pleased to say there has been, I mean, it would be wrong of me to say there's been no effect at all. I mean, there has been um, a drop in productivity, but really not significant. Uh, we've managed to contain that, uh, that slight drop in productivity, which means that none of the boats we're building for owners, so in other words, sold yachts, which have a, a real owner, um, are affected. So we haven't had to write to anybody and tell them that their, uh, their delivery is going to be delayed. Uh, to be perfectly honest with you, we have slightly rescheduled a couple of our uh, spec builds for next year, but they're still going to be well in time for the summer. So no uh, serious impact there. So, so how does that work with famously Heeson has the, the big countdown timers above each shed. Uh, so what's, what's happened to the, to the clocks, I suppose that, you know, you, you can't account the clock can't account for something like a pandemic so i guess there's, I guess there's some wiggle room there uh, yeah well i suppose whoever whoever manages the clocks can probably make some adjustments where necessary but that would be cheating i don't know i haven't been there to actually look at them uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll have a make a point of checking because that would be an interesting point um, but the other thing that we're, we're obviously a bit susceptible to is, of course, supply chain. Yeah. I mean, it's all very well having the shipyard running and all the workers there, but if you can't get any goods in, 
um, that's a problem. And again, you know, touch wood, uh, we managed to uh, hang on to the supply chain and keep production running. Um, I mean, I think we're quite lucky because unlike a lot of shipyards, you know, we have almost the entire production uh, of the yachts managed in-house ourselves. You know, as you know, we have our own interior manufacturer. Uh, so we're not re so much reliant on third party subcontractors to help us out with that stuff. And I think this has really, really come to the come to our help this time. Yeah. So let, so let's talk a bit about what actually, actually in the sheds at the moment. So what is on the production line currently in OS? Well, we've got the, the big one, the 80 meter Cosmos. Uh, she's in there. We've also got a 60 meter yacht in build. Uh, Project Falcon, as I say, both of those are unaffected. Um, we've got uh, Triton, which is the first boat we're going to, actually it's not the first boat we're going to deliver, the first boat we're going to deliver is um, Amare 2, Electra. She is, um, we're going through the delivery process now. Uh, we've got Triton, which, uh, which is for sale. Um, she is starting sea trials now, so we've managed to finally get her underway for the sea trials. They're delayed because we couldn't get the technical uh, people on board to do all the monitoring and measuring, uh, but now that's possible. Uh, what else have we got? We've got the 55 meter uh, Pollux, which is going to be ready for delivery at the end of this year. We've got the 55 meter Project Castor, which is going to be delivered uh, middle of the summer. Um, we've also got the 50 meter aquamarine. Um, she's the first of the new 50 meter aluminium semi displacement yachts. I mean, we're, we're quite well known uh, for the 50 meter aluminium semi displacement, the Satori class mm. that we started back in 2008 or 9. Uh, and this aquamarine is going to be the first of the new series. So we, we've stopped the uh, Satori class, we've designed a whole new yacht and Aquamarine is the first one. Um, we've also got a yacht called Altea, uh, which is another aluminium uh, yacht, but it's a displacement yacht, uh, but with a top speed, with quite a high speed, about 19 and a half knots, that's ready for delivery next year. So yeah, I mean, there's it's really quite a lot going on in the shipyard at the moment. Yeah, very busy. <laughs> well, let, let, let's, let's, let's dwell for a second. We can't stop. <laughs> Sorry? That's why we can't stop. Yeah, quite right, yeah. Um, let, let's let's talk for a second on the big the big one, Cosmos, eighty meters, your biggest ever boat. Um, you, you kind of sense the naming pattern in some of your your bigger projects, Galactic Star, Galactic Supernova, Cosmos. We can leave that there if you like. But the uh, it's it's a spectacular project. Um, and uh, so when are we going to see that first on the water? And, and what's the latest on on that project? Uh, well, our scheduled delivery date is uh, April 2022, so she will be launched uh, probably in about uh, January, February 2022, so that'll be, so if you've got your uh, yacht spotters out there with their cameras, that'll be the first opportunity to catch her. Um, but no, production's going well. Uh, it, it's a daunting sight. I mean, you know, we're used to seeing... Uh, you know, 50, 50 and 55 meter yachts in the shipyard. When you suddenly put a 80 meter yacht in the uh, construction hall um, and it's the, the width and the height of this yacht, you look at it and you think, bloody hell, you know, are we really doing that? Um, but it's great, it's very exciting. Project's going well. Um, next milestone coming up is on the 25th of June. So uh, well, less than a month from now, where we have the joining of the hull and superstructure and that's going to be a big one. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to invite uh, everybody there to see it. And I imagine the celebrations will be quite uh, reduced, but we'll, we'll find something to do. Um, we'll find a way of making sure everybody knows about it. So yeah, that's when you'll really see the true size of the yacht. Um, so then really from middle of June onwards, um, it will be, we'll start out the fitting out process. So all the, uh, the wiring, the plumbing, uh, the sub, uh, subfloors and compartments, you know, leading through to the uh, to the final interior. So um, yeah, that's looking good. And for people who aren't aware of where OS sits, the the position of OS, I mean, it's not like you're on the water. Uh, you are on the water, but you're not on the coast. Uh, so to get from OS to the sea is actually quite a circuitous route for the yachts. And I remember seeing some pictures of 
uh, Galactica Supernova getting out. Uh, and it, there was a, there's a bridge, isn't there, that uh, your yacht, your bigger yachts have to squeeze under. So obviously, that, what, that's quite a challenge, isn't it? Because when you're building something on the scale of Cosmos, obviously, you've got to be able to get it to the sea. So that, that's uh, got to be factored into the design from day one. Yes, um, I, I would just say, actually, I mean, um, yeah, Oss, of course, is known as the uh, undisputed capital of yacht building in the world. Um, <laughs> But uh, yes, getting the boat out is it is quite fun. It's about 120 kilometers of uh, canal and river network between us and the ocean. Um, and yes, it is a challenge. It's not only actually that bridge, uh, but there's also the locks. I think there's a lock that's 13 and a half meters wide. Um, so you're starting to get, you know, when you've got a 12 meter wide yacht and you're going through a 13 and a half meter wide uh, lock, it's, it's, it, it, you, you sort of breathe in when you get close to it. Um, Yes, the getting under that bridge will be really interesting because with Galactica Supernova, there was not a lot of margin. Yeah. Um, but I'm pretty confident our naval architects and engineers have probably taken that one on board. <laughs> Maybe we wait for a special low tide or something. I hope so, yeah. Super low tide, yeah. Um, so Cosmos obviously is a, a massive custom project, but... The great success Heaton has found has been in the semi-custom ranges. So how do you kind of balance those two interests at the shipyard? Yes, I mean, it's, um, it's interesting. Um, I, I would say that about, uh, at the moment we run about 50-50 with uh, full custom bills and then the uh, speculative semi-custom bills. And the speculative program is, uh, well, you've got to be brave to embark on that because obviously there's a lot of capital tied up as you build these boats for your own account. And you've got to have a certain uh, feel for what the market wants. And that's the reason why we've always stuck pretty much to this 50 meter, 500 gross ton up to 55 meter, 750 gross tons. You know, it's a very popular sector of the market. Mm. And I think it's nice for, uh, uh, convenient for, uh, owners to have a yacht that's already in build. I mean, there are lots of advantages. First of all, there's a there's a big saving in time, so you, you're going to get your boat sooner. Um, it's a much less stressful process because we've done all the design, engineering, research, and all the rest of it. So really, all they have to do is come in and maybe choose the interior, or even as simple as just choose the loose furniture. So it's quite a, a sort of low stress um, route to big boat yachting. Um, and then there's also the advantage of knowing what the performance of the boat will be because they're all virtually sister ships. So of course the performance, the speed, the range, the noise, all of that stuff um, is, is pretty much a dead cert when you're building it more than once. Um, and so far, touch wood, and hopefully it will continue the case that it's a, it's a successful program. Yeah. Well, I keep hearing how um, newer owners want their boat sooner and the patience well for three or four or even five year uh, construction periods is, is, is pretty low at the moment. People basically want instant gratification or as instant as it could possibly be and that, that even extends to their yachts. So that fits right into what you're trying to do at Heaton or what you are doing very successfully at Heaton. Yes, people are not becoming any more patient, that's for sure. Um, but then on the other hand, as I said, half our business is building full custom yachts. So there is, a, there is a certain sector of the population out there, people who are quite experienced yacht owners, who, um, who will always want to do their own thing. There is, of course, also the third route, the, the middle ground, which can also be very attractive for people. And we've done this several times, is where an owner takes one of our existing platforms. So it's already designed, engineered and proven and then uh, develops a new superstructure and a new interior. So then you get the best of both worlds. You get the full custom boat, it's certainly not look like anybody else's boat, mm -hmm. yet it's built on the underneath of an already proven platform. And as I say, we've done that a few times and that, that can be a really attractive option because you probably save about a year of uh, pre-design engineering and messing around on the whole build program. Yeah. So, so what, how do you brief a designer when you're building a semi-custom project that doesn't start with an owner? It might not even have an owner like Triton until the very end of the schedule. How do you brief a designer to design a boat uh, 
for the like, do you try and aim for the broadest possible audience segment or do you tie it to a particular look hoping for a, just a few interesting uh, yeah a good, good question there, there are two approaches to that is first of all we really only work with the top designers in the world um, so we hope that they will bring to the table uh, a lot of experience and a, a lot of market knowledge. I say hope, I mean, we, we know they do because they wouldn't be in the position they're in if they didn't. Um, so that, that, that's an advantage already. So these guys will say, well, look, hang on a minute, you know, owners are asking for this or, you know, that's a little bit old fashioned now. So you, you, you delve into a lot of um, uh, te- uh, expertise by doing that. And then we do the same with the interior design. Uh, we, we will only build boats really with top interior designers so that um, there's a, a brand value to it. And of course, you know, the top interior designers are good for, for, for justifiable reasons and uh, they, they do make very, very nice interiors. We try not to become too eclectic or too individual. Um, you try, obviously try to make the interior as flexible as possible. Um, but it, it's quite hard with a yacht. I mean, once you've traveled down a direction and you've made a decision of what the interior is going to look like, you really can't stop it because all the sections, the compartments are also linked with each other. If you mess around with the design of the saloon, you know, it's all connected to the atriums, the staircases, the owner's cabins and, and so on. Um, so, uh, yeah, you just, you just really need to know what the market wants, what people like and, it's a it's a degree of common sense really at the end of the day if you build something that's weird and wacky it's going to be hard to sell but if you build something that's top quality mainstream as they say the cream always rises to the top so uh it should sell it should work but there, there's always uh because i remember we, we've covered a lot of heat and projects now where uh owners have taken uh, bought the boat when it's basically been ready uh fully finished but then they've kind of sent it back to the yard for a little while for some design tweaks so there's that opportunity too so if someone bought triton tomorrow and they said oh but i want you know a different you know soft furnishings or what have you that you can do that there's some margin there for that oh yeah i mean that's all absolutely doable i mean uh you would be a lucky guy indeed to design a boat first time round and have somebody go on board and say that's exactly what I want. I'm not going to change anything. It doesn't really happen. Yeah. I, but I'm talking, it's an interesting subject because actually another advantage for people is, uh, is if they get involved in one of these spec builds at an early enough stage, they can then have an awful lot of influence on the interior. And that happens a lot. I mean, there's, there's one yacht we delivered last year, which was uh, started in build. And the owner had very specific tastes. He wanted a particular, even a particular layout of the boat. The layout was completely changed. Leave aside the interior design. He then brought in his interior designer and the, uh, the whole program was then um, customized for, for that owner's um, requirements. Worked very well, yeah. So when we're talking about, so what are, what are, what are owners asking of you? I mean, actually, I, in particular reference to, uh, uh, engine packages because I know Electra is obviously diesel electric and she's the same series as Home. Um, am I right in saying that? So, obviously, Home was uh, a very efficient boat, uh, very green minded, I suppose. That's how the owner wanted her, very quiet and green. So, are you seeing more and more of that? Are people demanding efficiency and a, a, a more eco aware yacht? Um, to be brutally honest, more and more not. But you know, we receive such a wide spectrum of inquiries for different yachts. I mean, on, you know, on the one hand, you're building a traditional steel displacement yacht like uh, Triton. And on the other hand, you know, you're building a 50 meter semi-displacement yacht with a top speed of over 20 knots for aquamarine. And then on the full custom side, you know, we're building a 60 meter yacht, which will have a top speed of the high end of 30 knots. So there's, it's really a big range of, um, of requirements that people, you know, it's, it's as varied as um, house building is, you know, it's all very much up to an individual's style and taste. Um, but having said that, you know, I do believe firmly that there is a future in, uh, in economical, in uh, eco uh, yachts. I think, I think it's going to become uh, much more interesting. Um, Maybe not today, but I think uh, the next generation where perhaps batteries um, play a bigger role. At the moment, it isn't really that practical on yachts. Um, There's too many of them required. It's too heavy. 
um, and the return on that isn't really that spectacular at the moment. But uh, I think battery technology will obviously improve and that will help things. And of course, there will be different propulsion sources that come along. I mean, there's all sorts of talk about fuel cells and all the rest of it. Um, and I'd like us to be at the cutting edge of that as it, as it uh, develops. I think we proved it with home, you know, that that boat was built 100% um, as a speculative build. There wasn't a, an owner behind it at the beginning. We took the decision to design a, a very uh, efficient boat. We built it in aluminium, lightweight, to save weight. Uh, we put in small engines that would still give it a, a good turn of speed. And we put the hybrid system in, and all of that was 100% uh, Heeson's risk. And um, I think it's exciting, though, to do that. And uh, um, I, I, I really think there will be, for sure, more of it, and better and better. Uh, that's the it's the beginning now. That, that's you kind of leading the market. I mean, that's uh, dictating, uh, I guess, uh, trends rather than following them. Which yeah, is quite, it's quite yeah. a great thing to do for a shipyard. It is, it is a very brave thing to do, and I still very much remember the day we were all sitting around the boardroom table talking about this, and we had one of two ways we could go. We could either make it a project on paper and um, put it out into the market as a sort of, you know, would you build it kind of thing, or we can say, right, guys, let's, uh, let, let, let's, let's have a go at this. Let's, let's put our money where our mouths are, literally, and, uh, and do this. Yeah. Yeah. Big old decision, that one. Yeah, yeah, great decision. Yeah, yeah, that one paid off. Very good. Um, I always people always ask uh, people who are unfamiliar with the world of super yachts always ask what the the trends are in super yachting, and it's always quite you can draw very broad ones inside, outside spaces, use of glass, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but because there's so few new boats being built in our sector, it's actually quite hard to draw a trend line. At least that's what I. Think from where I'm sitting but from where you're sitting are you able to plot a, a route um, I mean can you say customers want this and not that nowadays or the future customer is looking for this kind of boat or this shape of boat or this kind of decor what do you think on that yeah I, I, you're 100% you're right I mean it, 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 it doesn't move that much the yachting industry is incredibly conservative and I mean really in capital letters conservative almost almost to the point of being really probably too conservative I mean, people may very seldom step out of a comfort zone i mean there are a few notable exceptions out there the the two a yachts are obviously uh, quite uh, special and there's a few others that, are, that have been built over the period um but a trend i mean yes so you you pretty much mentioned them already the the biggest changes are i think structural glass is a is a is a really big benefit in our business um, communications is a, is a huge benefit you know people reliably now can sit on their boat and genuinely get pretty decent telephone and television reception is almost as good as they get at home cost a fortune but uh, at least it's now available um, what else is there I think stabilization has helped quite a lot zero speed stabilizers I mean they came in not long ago gyro stabilizers big big leap forward and my opinion I think actually the biggest leap forward, and it still could, could still needs, I think, a little bit of tweaking to make it work really well, is, um, is chucking the tenders out of the uh, back of the boat, putting them on the foredeck, and making the beach club into, a, into the, the tender garage, into a beach club, terrace, wellness center. I mean, it, it, it was such an obvious one. I can't believe we didn't think about it before. To turn that area that's at the back of the boat, it's a protected part of the boat, it's on the water, and yet we went and put our tenders in there, making it into your garage. Um, but because now the um, you know, people have been working with the same principles of an old uh, tender garage converted into a beach club, um, but I think you, you're beginning to see where that area is actually a design feature in its own right. And if you can bring the floor up so you can bring the levels up so that people are at the same level as the sea, if you can get light in, if you can get opening side doors, wow. I mean, you have literally the best terrace on the water there. Yeah. It's almost uh, when you go around an older yacht now and that area is not a beach club because it hasn't been refitted, it, it's almost... Seems, it's almost yeah, strange. 
Yeah, yeah, you think, you know, and, and it's a sort of dark hole in the back of the boat full yeah. of tenders and toys and bits and pieces and all the rest of it. Yeah, no, I think um, sticking them on the foredeck was, was a brilliant idea. So let's just actually, before we finish on that, that one, the R Aquamarine is coming out next year. That's the, the first of the new 50 meter aluminium boats. That was where we tried to improve that area. And we have actually on her brought the floor level up so that it's flush with the swim platform. So when you open the swim platform, you know, you, you've then got a flush deck. You don't, you're not going downstairs into a, into a different compartment. You're flush with the sea, with the platform, you know, with, the, with the view. It'll be nice. I'm just looking at a picture of her now as well. Yes, a great looking boat. So that's Amiga, obviously, and Cristiano Gatto, who are two designers or two studios rather that you're very familiar with and have done a lot of projects. Done a, done a bit of work with both of them. I mean, Frank at Omega has been with Heeson since, I mean, 40 years probably, because uh, he used to work for Heeson at the beginning and then uh, left and started his own studio and, uh, and is, is still with us. Um, still designing iconic yachts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and he, he's obviously he did uh, Galactic Star was his, wasn't it? And then Espen did Supernova, and then uh, Winch Design Cosmos. Oh, you're very well informed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. You got them all right, and in the right order. <laughs> the, um, to talk about uh, just refit quickly, because a lot of new build yards are getting into the refit game because the fleet's aging. Obviously, you've got a lot of boats on the water. Are you tempted to offer that service or partner with a refit yard somewhere like other, other new build shipyards have done? Yeah, we're not, we're not looking at doing um, a refit business as a, as a separate business unit. Uh, we have a very, very long standing, I mean, many 20 years or something, relationship with IMS shipyard in Toulon, uh, which, which is where we do refer Heese and Yachts to for... Uh, uh, work. Um, the issue is with us is that um, it's, it's not that convenient to come all the way back to us as you mentioned right at the beginning you know, you've got this 120 odd kilometers of canal uh, we've got the bridges to go underneath and the locks to go through so before a boat can come back to us you know, you've got to dismantle the top mast to start with and you've got to motor all the way up the river and then you've got our um, the program in the shipyard is not geared for um, inserting a refit project in the build program because we, we have a program uh, mapped out going forward uh, five plus years of what's going to happen and um, unless you've got somebody who I mean you know, if you start building a spec boat now you're it's going to take about a year to build the hull and superstructure so a year from now it will go into one of our sheds to start fitting out um, you know, you'd, you'd need to stop all of that, mothball the hull in order to put a refit. It, it doesn't really work. It, it, no, no yeah. not with a new shipyard. No, we, we continue to work with IMS and service and support our clients, uh, either directly from the shipyard through our after sales uh, network, or um, as I say, through IMS and, and other preferred shipyards that we have a, arrangements with around the place. Um. Yeah, and I suppose it's, it's a nice place to be. I mean, if you don't need, if, you, if your new build program is so busy that it's, it's not a focus, I suppose that's quite a, it's a, quite a nice place to be as a business. Yes, but I think most of the other shipyards that do refit, I mean, I don't know if they do it in their main, uh, in their headquarter shipyard, let's say, or, or whether they have a satellite operation. I've never really studied it, to be honest. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the next big diary date, June the 25th, Holland Superstructure of Cosmos. I look forward to seeing the pictures of that. It should be I would invite you over, but I guess uh, it's not going to be so easy. I'd love to come, but then um, I have to be locked in for two weeks because uh, once you go out, coming back in, of course, you have to isolate for two yeah, weeks. Yeah, uh, that may well change. And I think there's, I think there's another... There's another announcement is on the 8th of June, I think, they talked about. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I just want the schools to go back. It's my priority, obviously. <laughs> um, that's, yeah, that would help my uh, state. Where, where, you, you're probably, you're now on, is it half term now? Half term um, now, yeah. So the, the, they, there's no way, I don't think, the kids will go back before summer holidays. Yeah, you're, they're not going to go back till September now, are they? No. 
So that's is that that's nearly two whole terms lost, isn't it? Yeah. 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 We've had to figure out homeschooling and uh, I am no teacher. That's for sure. I was going to say, you're probably quite a good teacher by now. How's your maths and Latin? <laughs> no patience whatsoever. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, sorry, we diverged. That's OK. Um, well, how, just quickly, how are you staying sane, Mark, in Shropshire? Oh, well, um, it's actually very pleasant. I mean, I, I live in a very rural location, so uh, isolation comes with the uh, comes with the territory here. So that's that was the easy bit. And, you know, there's not an awful lot of people who live around us. So for us to be able to go out for walks for miles and not see somebody is is pretty normal thing. But we have done a couple of things that are quite fun. Um, we've got a small pond in the garden uh, and we've built a jetty over that. And then uh, we've built a couple of remote controlled sailing yachts. Um, so we can now have sailing races on the pond with Ed. And in fact, uh, it's the day after tomorrow, 30th of May, is the day when the uh, now cancelled round the island race should take place. So I'm thinking that we might just stage our own round the island race um, up here in Shropshire. And then when we finish that, because that didn't uh, occupy all of lockdown, not that it's over, uh, we then built a, um, a log cabin. Uh, which is again, which is the building that the uh, media awesome. boats are going to go in. <laughs> I mean, these are all completely ridiculous projects, but very entertaining. Yeah, great. Tell to get the drone out. We'll get some good footage of the uh, of the remote controlled yacht race. That'd be good fun. I, I'll see if I can. Yeah, definitely. He's, yeah, when he's up here, I'll do that. Um, well, <laughs> so my, yeah, that's all I'm doing. Well, that, that's uh, yeah. It's much better. Uh, uh, yeah, it's much better uh, sanity exercise than uh, trying to teach your kids uh, French, I can tell you that. So, um, Mark, uh, I really appreciate the time. Thank you so much. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for, for, um, for asking the questions and for, it was enjoyable, very enjoyable. Thank you. No problem at all. Thanks very much and uh, we'll speak soon. Thank you. Okay.